Hello, welcome to the Ghosts of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 151 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 7 of A Storm of Swords, that's John 1. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter, we're going to try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we'll provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarize the happenings, discuss our thoughts on them, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll give you some extra information, which will be particularly handy if you're not reading along. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing just fine. How are you, my friend? I'm okay. Good, good, good. Just uh, packed my niece back off to the UK after seven weeks here. That's right. Yes. I, I never even nice... got to meet her. I'm yeah. really bummed about that. Yeah, she's she's a good kid. She's a good kid. We had a nice time. Good. I'm saying that because she might listen one day. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a good kid. We enjoyed her visit. And plus, it just made us do things. You know what I mean? If oh, yeah. If we, we'd sure. been here for the summer, we'd have just sat around doing nothing. But we did a bunch of stuff because she was here. Yeah, that's very cool. That's that's usually what um, prompts doing things when you're yeah. in your in your hometown. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good stuff. Yeah, we've got uh, most of my wife's family is coming into town this weekend, and they'll be here for like a week or so. So, and oh. you know, you you know, this has been an ongoing saga. We've had a, a bit of a furniture. Uh, swap as ethan took our furniture and stacy went out and bought multiple sets of new versions of the furniture yes. yes so one of the uh couches came in today which is great because it came in just in time for someone to be able to sleep on it okay and um except for that so it's a, a sectional couch so it's got like the traditional couch part and then it's got a, a like a chaise lounge that sticks out on the left side oh. Yep, I can picture the thing, yes. Yes, okay, well, it, it, it was delivered today, and the the two nice uh, gentlemen that were the, the moving team started started their way up the stairs, and the guy on the, on the bottom of the couch part said, wait, nope, nope, got to go back out, got to go back out. And the other guy and I were both like, well, that's an odd thing to say right about now while you're on uh-huh. your way up the stairs. And so they... They walk their way back down the stairs and out the door, and he's like, I can feel it in my hand. I can feel it in my hand. And we look, the whole side of the chase lounge part was busted in. Like, the wood was sticking out through the material. So, oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, luckily, the other part seems to be all right, and it's long enough that someone can sleep on it. It's just, it's missing the whole left part of the Couch. Oh, I see. So they're going to replace that section. Yes, because it came in two separate pieces. I see. So well, yeah. okay. I mean, yeah. it could be worse. It I could mean, be that's... yes. Yeah. And above the two pieces, that's the one that's less important. Right. If, if it had just you, had a chase, you still have a couch. <laughs> yes. Rather than just an odd object hanging around your room. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So, so did he puncture it there and then, or did he notice it? He said he could feel it in his hand. He could. It was so busted. I watched, unless it happened while they were getting it off the truck, because I wasn't up there for that. It was, it must have been like that, because I watched them wheel it down the sidewalk from my driveway, and I held the door while they went up in it, and I didn't, or up through it, and I didn't see any place where something could have gotten that busted, to the point that the wood was sticking out of the fabric. I mean, that was, it It was clearly dropped from a distance or something. Yeah. So. Well, I don't have much, but it is very hot at the moment. It sure and, is. And um, I played tennis at lunchtime today. Oh, and it was, lunchtime. Yeah, it was very, very hot. So, and I've just replaced the grip on my tennis racket, and the new grip is not quite as sticky as I'm used to. <laughs> and, oh, no. What happened? <laughs> well, I mean, you've already guessed where this goes. So I hit this rocket forehand uh-huh. and ball rockets and racket rockets. And the racket flew into the fence to the, to the side of the thing. But 
the point was still alive. And you know me. You know what I bring to sports is oh, yes. a little bit of industry, a little bit of get up and go. Yes. So I race over there and pick that thing up. And I run back on the court and I hit the ball back. But he said it bounced twice. Before oh, I, I so thought you I were like, going to ah. say you got to it. Ah. Yes, yes. I, uh, You and I have been playing uh, sports together for coming up on 20 years. And Two, your your two biggest assets are the fact that you have a tireless engine and yep. you have a competitive streak that I don't know. I don't know many people that have the competitive streak that you have. Even when we were just shooting around, pl- shooting baskets, you and I would be like, okay, we got to we gotta play a game. I can't just do I this. We, we were in our work clothes. <laughs> yes. yeah. I was like, come on, this is boring. It was like your first day of work at our, <laughs> at our company. <laughs> we just went up to mess around and shoot some hoops. <laughs> and you, you talked me into playing a game. So, yes, I would not have been shocked if you said you managed to get to that racket and get the point. He might have been cheating. I mean, I don't know. I, because I, I, had, I had to keep my eye on the racket. And I, I, had a, I just had an inkling that he would just lob it back into the empty court. You know, right, Thinking yeah. there was no danger since I had no racket. <laughs> Could you but swat that, it? <laughs> it happened yesterday too. I, I dropped my racket yesterday as well, and, and then that time it just came straight back to me. And I, I was tempted to kick it, but I'm pretty sure that's against the rules. <laughs> it is. It's blistering out there. Though. Maybe you need to to tape the your hand, the racket to your hand. To my hand. Yes, yes I like that. That, plan. that might be the next step there. Yeah. Oh. All right. Let's get down to business. How did we leave Jon Snow? Last we saw of Jon, he'd just killed Corrin Halfhand in single combat. Well, to be honest, in single combat, Corrin would have won easily, but Ghost intervened to give Jon the edge. Right. He understood his mission, but having to slay a man he'd come to revere and trust was clearly going to play on his mind, being Jon Snow and all. Right. But Rattleshirt was not fully appeased, but his subordinates were, and so Jon joined the party, at least until Mance Raider could decide his fate. McKelly, why don't we give him the summary of this one? All right. John sees the wildling camp in the Valley of the Milkwater. It's huge. The cook fires are beyond counting. John is with Rattleshirt, Egret, Leno, Ragwile, and Longspear Rick. In addition, Ghost trots along behind, while the ever-present eagle flies above. The journey has been punctuated by Rattleshirt's threats and distrust, with the occasional reassuring word from Egret, who believes that Corin's death will suffice to gain him his freedom. John questions what his freedom will entail. Can he leave? Sure he can, but the wildlings would then be equally free to kill him if he did. As they climb down to, into the valley, eight outriders join them and judge them friendly with a glance. Their leader is a known wildling, the Weeper. He discusses John with the members of John's party. They bring up his dispatch of Corin, claiming that John's a warg. The Weeper says that he has a wolfish look. He waves them on toward Mance. The local dogs howl at Ghost, who pays them no mind. John observes that they know he's not their kind, and John thinks the same about himself among the free folk. While numbers and disposition of the warriors is part of John's mission, the real question is what power Mance was looking for, and did he find it? He witnesses military preparations, weapons being fashioned and fighters being drilled, but he also notices a lot of children and families. They stop and make camp. Rattleshirt, Egret, and Longspear lead John onwards. He notices that the camp is badly disorganised, and even a small, well-drilled mounted force would harry and demoralise this camp with impunity. They reach Mance's tent, and Ghost must stay without. Inside, it is hot, and it's not clear who Mance might be. There are several men and women being serenaded by a musician. John takes a guess at who's king, and is proved wrong when Mance puts down his lute and introduces himself, and stuns John by knowing who he is. Mance is genuinely conflicted about the news of Corrin's death. John is introduced to Steer, the earless man he mistook for the king, and a white-bearded Tormund. Also to Mance's pregnant woman, Dala, her sister Val, and Val's lover Jarl. John's sketchy with the truth over how he came to be in Corrin's company, and Torment accurately predicts it was Craster who told the crows where to look, but Mance fondly chastises Tormund for not giving John a chance to lie. 
Mance asks the others, except Dala, to leave so he can speak to John alone. Mance explains how he knew John. When John was small, Mance visited Winterfell with the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Mance stumbled upon John and Rob preparing a snowy surprise for some unsuspecting person and promised to not tell. That vow he kept. And Fat Tom paid the price. The other time turns out to be when Robert was in Winterfell. John is gobsmacked. Mance heard of the visit, slipped over the wall, and joined the entourage south of Winterfell and earned his keep as a musician. John compares the exploit to Bale the Bard. Mance admits that Bale was his inspiration, but also admits that he only sang the songs. Bale lived them. Mance explains that he deserted because a wildling woman saved him after he was mauled by a shadow cat. While he healed, she sewed up his tattered cloak with red silk from a shipwreck. It was her greatest treasure. When he got back to the shadow tower, he was issued a new cloak. His decorated one was fit only for the flames. He left the next day. So why did John desert? He comes up with a great lie. You were there. You saw where I sat at the feast. Oh yeah, with the lowest of the low, while the trueborn Starks were at the top table with the royals. Mance is convinced. We'd best find you a new cloak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was so, quick with the lie. I guess he had time. He had time yeah, he to had a long time. But except, of course, it was it was situational because of what Mance told him. You know, true. Yes, yes. I mean, it could have been already in plan. You know, hey, the Starks always treated me as a second class citizen. Um. I gotta say, Mans feels a little trusting here. I mean, mm -hmm. John's story is paper thin. He killed Corin, but the witnesses to Corin's death know a that John was very lucky, and b that Corin initiated the fight. Right. So yes. John was simply fighting for his life. He wasn't necessarily betraying the Night's Watch at that point. That's a very solid, very astute observation. Yes, right. And so, and this story, I mean, okay, I can understand why you might betray the Starks, but yes. to betray the Night's Watch and the kingdom south of the Wall seems like a big leap from this. Yes, it does. It's, it doesn't quite explain why, you, because the Starks mistreated you or you felt you were not given your rightful respect yes. you why would if, you <laughs> if corin's last name was half stark <laughs> maybe <laughs> but i don't know there's something just doesn't hang together it feels like mance is a little too willing to accept him and maybe mance is thinking let's keep my enemies close you know yes yes that's I very don't possible actually trust this guy but let's bring him in and it's also possible that mance really wants to believe him Right. Really? He wants a friend, wants someone with a common background to him. Yes, right. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I will say, w w just to mention, when we get to the TV show, the, he has a very different lie. And I'd like to, at that point, we might compare the two yeah. lies to see okay. which one's more convincing. I like it. We'll compare the book with the TV show. Right, which is kind of <laughs> what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> So John and we both get introductions to the the free folk slash wildling, whatever you want to call them, society beyond the one-offs that we've met so far, like Egret and Craster. This is the first time we've seen basically all the wildlings in one location right. here, get an idea of how many there are and kind of what their what their daily lives are like. Yes, and uh you're right about the numbers. I mean, I mean, we already knew this, but this the numbers are vast. I mean, he says the more, there are more fires than John could count, hundreds, perhaps thousands. I noticed in the TV show, I counted eight. <laughs> <laughs> it was a low angle. Probably there were more beyond. Right. <laughs> uh, he says it, it basically, so you've got the river running through this valley, and then alongside the river, you have the sort of second river of flickering lights, which is nice imagery. Well done. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah, you know, in some ways... There's some similarities. There's also some differences. But in some ways, his experience here feels similar to Danny's with the Dothraki. You know, uh, yeah. Neither had a say in the matter of joining this group. It both came in with preconceived notions of the people and the culture. And now we've seen Danny learn to embrace the Dothraki culture. But of course, 
she had the guidance of Khal Drogo, her handmaids, Jora. Well, it, we don't know yet whether or not John will be so lucky as to uh, feel well. And also, she came in in a very high place in the Kalisar. Well, here's yes, true, higher than John, but here he is in the tent of the king beyond the wall. I mean, yes, it's not that's like a good he's point. having yep. to climb the slippery pole to get there. They brought him straight to him. And Mance clearly wants to hang out with John to a certain extent anyway. Right. Yes, I I, I think the fact that he is a former brother of well, at least as Mance thinks, former brother of the Night's Watch might elevate him in uh, status. Yeah immediately yeah. which might rub people the wrong way you know if he if he's right. palling around with the king and uh you know the the king's court for lack of a better word here uh people who have been working their way trying to get to that kind of elevated status might um you know resent him for it yeah of course man's could appease them by saying i'm just keeping an eye on him i don't trust him sort of True. thing but that's that's yeah true. it's yeah, it's a, it's definitely something to watch for because I because I really don't know where this is going. I mean, it's possible that Mans might say, you know, rattle shirt, keep an eye on him, kill him if he does something. It might be that they become firm buddies, you know, and and sure. and then John starts to become conflicted very much, as you say, like Daenerys, who becomes who became more and more Dothraki. Maybe John becomes more and more of a sympathis sympathizer to the wildling cause. Yeah, very possible. One difference is that. John comes in with allegiance to another opposing group. Danny right. doesn't, you know, when she married Khal Drogo, she didn't come in being, you know, associated with a group that was an enemy to the Dothraki. Yeah. So I guess there's, he, he multiple times thinks in his head, this is, I'm here to do a task. I'm not here right. to become buddies with these people. But if he keeps to ch if he keeps chanting that, it will sound more and more like he's trying to convince himself. True. You know? Yes. Right. Right. He, now he's trying to remind himself. If if his bonds with these people grow, it might change into trying to convince himself. Yes, that very well is possible. And and actually, this goes to sort of like the cleverness of the story in some ways, because because we've complained several times about the point of the Night's Watch and how they sort of target the wildlings, even though the wildlings aren't really doing anything to hurt the Seven Kingdoms. Right. So the chances of John becoming sympathetic to the Wildling cause are that much greater because their cause is basically sympathetic. They are trapped north of the wall and some unspeakable evil is about to descend upon them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's a very solid point. Yes, very much. But so since John is the boots on the ground here, he assesses the the chaotic, haphazard nature of the the camp uh, and also notices that they have very little in the way of defense, which would make attacking this large collection, this army, for lack of a better word, rather easy in his assessment of you know what he's seen. Yes, all you have to do is gather together an army, go north of the wall, tramp through the frost fangs for five <laughs> days, and attack them. <laughs> Piece of cake! I gotta say, I have to say, it is definitely possible that Mans Raider said, just pitch your tent wherever. When we march south towards the wall, there'll be more instructions about the way we pitch our that, tents. That's possible. Know? That's possible. Of course, that that would mean that Mance does not know about the great ranging sitting on the fist of the first men, which I found a, I'd find a little surprising because of they've kept bonfires burning basically on the top of that hill for. <laughs> Oh, quite a while now. It seems like someone may have noticed, but you know, it's a, it's a vast area with lots of hills, so maybe not. Yeah. But we we do know that Lord Commander Mormont last um, in the prologue with the Chet prologue decided to do a, a surprise attack on this army, and you know, based on what John is seeing, it's possible that they might be able to pull it off, even though they're so heavily outnumbered. Yeah. Definitely. I think the one thing is, of course, is that when the small groups were coming into the Frostfangs, they got quite close to the army. They didn't get all the way. The only reason that the army was spotted was through ghost size, remember? When all 300 of them come, they're going to get spotted early, and then you can tighten up your defensive formation, you know? Well, there's that, yeah. I think 
Smallwood and his group did see the Outriders, of the kind of the vanguard of Mance's much larger group, and I think they got some idea of how many people were up there, but maybe not a, a, a completely accurate account of what's coming their way. Yeah, I I, I definitely think that, that Mance does not think they're in any danger up there. Um, and right. if they do march south towards the wall, he will expect more threats, and so, you know, the the... The defenses can tighten up. Yeah, and now of course we know that the the White Walkers uh, have seemed to have arrived at the Fist of the First Men. At least the we heard three blasts anyway in Chet Peter's pants. Right. So, but yeah, yeah, uh, or three John... separate groups of Night's Watch have arrived. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, but John feels like a surprise attack by a smaller, better armed and trained and skilled force might be successful. And we see he sees a man making wooden spears and, uh, you know, he sees people in leather and just bits of steel, mostly just boiled leather and wool. So they are heavily out armed. Yeah, but but I mean, still, you you... You can take bites out of an army this big and you can demoralize them, but they're going to learn your tactics and defend against them and their sheer weight of numbers will will whittle you down. You would think so. You would think this heavily outnumbered, like tens of thousands. Yeah, against 300. Yeah, right. (laughs) So the the comparison with the Kalasar is quite interesting, actually, because, because they too sort of like pitched their tents wherever and were kind of relaxed about things in many ways i think for the same reason that they didn't feel like they had any enemies that they were i mean i mean literally the wildlings think that they're the only people north of the wall there's right. nothing to guard against you know yes right because they don't know about the great ranging and similarly i mean the kalasar had other kalasars to worry about but yeah cal drogo's kalasar was like forty thousand people strong yeah so you would think you'd almost like a, a roving city, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there are there are some differences there because um, the this seems rather rare for the wildlings to be gathered right. like this. They usually seem to be in wildling villages, whereas the Dothraki, that's kind of their thing, is they're a roving Kalasar, and they only pay special visits to Vase Dothrak, where they congregate in one location for any kind of extended period of time yeah so john it doesn't know doesn't know what to make of all of this freedom i mean he he we've mentioned i think even in the last chapter that he was amazed at the lack of respect that rattleshirt received from egret and rick and the others um and the the lack of structure of the camp sort of like adds to that view of what's all very well being free but if you're not if you're not uh, disciplined, you're going to pay the price. True, right, yeah. Yeah, it feels like he can only really see, take in this scene through the lens of his experience, which is how most of us take in especially new things. He grew up in Winterfell under the guidance of Ned Stark where discipline and structure are heavy focus, and then he goes to Castle Black where there's a similar discipline and structure. So this, all this Freedom must just look like complete chaos to him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and it is interesting that that Mance is styled as the king north of the wall because it does seem that there's a there's a distinct lack of respect for leadership. Right. The... Yes. So it... I wonder. I, I wonder if it is just the sense of the common enemy here, the White Walkers, that's brought them together under one flag. Yes, I, I've been thinking about it all week that it the fact that they would all fall under the guidance of a particular man, a king beyond the wall, in some ways goes against their whole philosophy, yeah. their whole free folk. That's what they call themselves, the free folk. And here they are all falling in line under one king. And, and uh, yes, like you said, maybe it's out of necessity. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're willing Nothing to like do an ex- this. existential threat to change your sort of philosophy. Right. Yes, 
the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They, mm. They've uh, yeah, and 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 the other thing is, it, it is expedient to choose Mance as a leader at this point because he has intel about where they need to go. Because where else are the wildlings going to go to escape the White Walkers on the other side of that seven hundred foot wall? And Not Mance many places. Is the, right, Mance is the one person who, as we learned later in the chapter, apparently knows how to get across the wall. He's done it during this book. He's done it. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, he said the wall can stop an army, but it can't stop a single person. He made but... that exact point, and that's true. But I mean, it goes to the fact that he does know its strengths and weaknesses, and so he right. is—he's the man you choose for leading you at this moment. If you sure. were to choose a leader for the first time. He's been on both sides of the wall. He's right. got uh, got the knowledge that a lot of the others don't. Yeah. So so John and Egret talk, um, talk about freedom. And Egret says in their hearts, all crows want to be free. And I think she's got a point there, actually, because... Definitely. I mean, very few of them seem to follow their vows like Corin Halfham does, you know? Yes. I... I thought the same thing. I thought in my head she's more right than she might realize that she right, is. Right, right. She's probably just poking John, but she's actually hitting on a truth. Yeah. yeah. So many of them were sent there as punishment for a crime. Right. They're not there. A great majority of them are not there because they wanted to be these members of the Night's Watch. Yeah. But John tests the bounds of this freedom. He says, am I free to leave? And Ygritte, I mean, it's a reasonable answer. She says, sure, you're free to leave, but then we're free to kill you because <laughs> if you decide to leave, then you were a spy all along, and so we're going to kill you, you know? Right. He, she doesn't spell all that out, but that's what she means. And it, if I were John, I'd be a little bit more subtle about my long-term plans. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it would have been worse if you'd said, after I've gathered intelligence, am I okay to leave? <laughs> <laughs> when I've gotten everything I need from you all... <laughs> Yeah, she says freedom is a dangerous thing, but then she adds that most like the taste of it. You'll see. Yeah. So, it, you know, her two bits, in their hearts, all crows want to be free, and then freedom's dangerous, but most like the taste of it. You'll see. It makes me wonder if maybe he'll meet other brothers aside from Mance in this wild uh, yeah. party. Yeah. We saw when we met Osha, when Bran... And Rob and Theon met Osha. She was with Stig, who is a, a brother of the Night's Watch who had uh, fled. Right. So, but, no. but he wasn't necessarily... Uh, was Had he been a traitor on the north side of the wall? Or... Yeah, I don't he... think we know. I don't... I don't right. If that was mentioned, I don't recall. Right. More likely, he bumped into them as they were trying to get across the wall. And he was like, yeah, let's go. Let's go together. I don't like it here very much. <laughs> Very possible. Yeah. yeah. So John, John, of course, is still thinking like a, a black brother, as, we, as, we, as we've mentioned. Um, he sort of reminds himself that he needs to see, to hear, to learn, and take it back to Castle Black. And because of what Corin Harfan gave up to put him in this position, he feels it's a, a very solemn duty. Yes, and that is a good point. This cost Corin his life. So right. as many times as he might, even if he begins to become swayed by the wildling life. To, to get that taste for freedom. Yes. He, uh, Corrin had to give up his life for it. So, yeah, yeah that is definitely something to, uh, to think about. Or that he will need to think about as he's going along this yeah. task that Although he's been assigned. Corrin was pretty sure he was toast anyway. I mean, that, that's one thing that might appease John's uh, guilty conscience is that Corin was for it, and in probably a much worse way than he died at John's hand. Yes, that's um, very possible, yes. Yeah. And of John also, he sees the women fletching arrows, and he thinks that those arrows were made for his brothers of the Night's Watch, and his father's people, those, you know, in Winterfell and Last Hearth. And so he's still, you know, like you said, he's still thinking like a brother of the Night's Watch, and it, in some ways, that he needs to cling to that. He needs to remember, regardless of how he starts to feel, he needs to remember what the point of this task is. But yeah. on the other hand, it could make it tough to carry out the plan successfully if he, if he too much acts like a brother of the Night's Watch. 
happy. So why are you doing that for? Yes. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Where do you keep these things? <laughs> What'd you guys find up in those mountains? <laughs> How are we getting across the wall? <laughs> <laughs> so he's got to really balance, uh, really walk a fine line here. So he, John, eventually makes it into Mance's tent and Mance asks, he asks John how many were there in your group, but he looks to Rattleshirt for the answer. And Rattleshirt says there were five crows, three dead, one climbed a mountain that the horses couldn't follow, and then John is here. And so he's talking about Stone Snake, and Stone Snake was on foot because his horse broke its leg after seeing a shadow cat and uh, Corrin gave him a new task rather than uh, fleeing with with John and right. Corrin. He said, you know, you you have a skill that nobody else can match. Your single, uh, your single talent makes you unique that you can scale these mountains and so sends him off to do that with a task to tell Mormont what John saw in his dream, which was giants, wargs, and worse, and the trees have eyes again. That was that was the message he wanted uh, Stone Snake to deliver. But then uh, Rattleshirt also mention, mentions that John killed Orel, which, you know, as we can t- deduce based on the people we know John has killed, is the name of the man killed on the mountaintop that he and Stone Snake came across before he spared Egret. Right. All the way to through the camp and before they got to the camp, they were uh, they were being followed by the eagle soaring on great wings that they'd seen previously. Presumably, the eagle that helped trap uh, John and Corin as they tried to go through the tunnel. Right. Yeah. He's that eagle has alerted the wildlings to their presence since they began to flee after John's dream with Ghost. And presumably also the eagle that hurt ghost, right? I mean, yes, you would think so. Yes. And yeah. last John chapter at the end of Clash of Kings, Egret said, I don't have the exact quote, but something along the lines to John of that eagle hates you, John Snow. Right, right. And we haven't yet learned why the eagle hates him, I don't believe. So okay. uh, we won't go down that road right now okay but you know the stone snake news is news to john that that the wildlings hadn't found and killed stone stone snake so of course he was alone on foot in the frost fangs he very well could have succumbed to the elements but yeah at least as far as john's found out they have not they have not killed stone snake yet or caught him anyway but but honestly he's not bringing an awful lot of intel back that uh, Smallwood didn't bring back himself, right? I mean, they know right. they know roughly where they are, and they know there's a lot of them. Sure, some of the some of some of the supernatural parts of it will be news, but right, yes, that's that's the part that uh, Corrin wanted uh, Mormont to have yeah. is that there's supernatural things, giants, wargs, and worse. The trees have eyes again. All that kind of stuff seems to be what he wanted him to convey to yeah. Mormont. Another thing about Rattleshirt is that this happens earlier in the chapter. John's band comes across the Weeper and his um, his band, and Rattleshirt almost kind of tries to take credit a little bit for killing Corin by saying, uh, "The Weeper says, what's with the crow you got there?'" And he says, "He's turned cloak. He's scared that I'll take his bones like I did Corin yes. half hands." And then uh, Long Spear Rick outs him and says, "Yeah, John. The, yeah, the crow killed Corin Halfhand." <laughs> you see, see, that's why you need a little bit more authority. You see, I like my role right. as a manager in my group because I'm like, okay, when I tell my boss this, I want you all to keep stum about the truth. Okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> when I take credit for something, no one, <laughs> no one helps me on it. <laughs> so Rattlesnake says that. Um, it, that if Mans finds John falls, which R- Rattlesnake certainly believes he will, I'm right. calling him Rattlesnake now. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Rattleshirt and Stone Snake. This is a bad combination right here. <laughs> so 
Rattleshirt tells John that if Mance finds him false, which Rattleshirt certainly believes he will, then Rattleshirt gets to kill John, and he's looking forward to that. Um, but it does kind of clear... It clearly states that Rattleshirt... Well, I think Rattleshirt could have dispatched John if he'd had the backing of his group. The problem was he didn't never had that backing because everybody else thought John had proved himself to be loyal to the wildlings you know, trade yeah. to the Night's Watch by killing Corrin. So, right. um, I guess what he's looking for is a higher authority to give him permission to do what he wants to do against the wishes of everybody else. True. Yes, that seems like that's exactly what he's looking for. But Egret has the opposite thought. She says Mance will accept John when he learns that John killed Corrin. And uh, so that nobody will be able to kill John like Rattle shirt has been has just claimed he's going to do. Yeah, so John figured that uh, Steer or Tormen must be man's because they look like warriors, um, and of course he was playing the lute. You wouldn't think that would be the king, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> So when Mance reveals himself, he he, he introduces Tormund and he he just says, "This is Tormund." And Tormund's like, "Wait a minute, I want to, I want some of my honorifics, please." So Mance then calls him uh, Giant's Bane, Tall Talker, Thunder Fist, Husband of Bears, Father of Hosts, and Mead King of Ruddy Hall, and the Hornblower, Breaker of Ice, and Speaker to Gods. Yeah, those are quite the titles right there. Yeah. So, I guess if you're winging it, you might come up with those kinds of things. <laughs> it sounded like there was some some re- reality behind them, yes? Yeah, but at least behind some of them. I mean, so we could take them one at a time um, and just, I, I don't know if, I've got them listed here. I don't know if they're in the exact order that he said them in, but um, so, you know, Giant's Bane, possibly he killed a giant. That's yeah. that, or at least... Uh, in the very one. next one, Tall Talker, maybe at least tells a tale that yes. he's killed a giant. Which, which is how he got several of these honorifics, presumably. <laughs> right. Uh, Thunderfist, I mean, I'm guessing he can hit things pretty hard. He's a big, strong lad. Right, uh, right, yeah. And that uh, uh, husband to bears reminds me a lot of Mage Mormont because Mage Mormont, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's rumored that she... Uh, that her children are the product of mage and a bear. So, uh, you know, I guess they've got that going for them together there. The father of hosts, presumably he's got a lot of children, and uh, the Mead King may suggest he's a bit of a drinker as well. I'm beginning right. to like this fella. <laughs> Seems like a good enough guy. Th- then we get into Hornblower, Breaker of Ice, and Speaker to Gods. And they're... we're just meeting this guy, so there's... Def, you know, we can only make conjectures about things. And Hornblower, you know, I, I I was thinking about it. I was actually listening to the chapter while I was walking the dog right before we started recording. And a couple thoughts came to my mind about some of these here. Hornblower, I thought maybe he likes to brag of deeds that he's done. He likes to blow his own horn. Yeah. That is that's that is possible. Yeah. Uh, and then Speaker to Gods. There's one piece of description in this chapter that says that Tormund has gold bands graven with runes that bound his arms. And so maybe he's got some sort of religious, you know, old gods type uh, connection that we haven't been introduced to yet. Yes. When I hear Hornblower and Breaker of Ice as a combination, then that does make me that 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 takes me back to the Battle of Jericho, because I have my biblical uh, background right. that you, yes. you you heathen don't, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if that feels like if if you had a big enough horn that had magical powers, you might be able to blow down the wall and get out of the. So maybe these are what he's saying. Maybe That's very possible. This is yes. a clue towards what Mance was looking for. I was... that's absolutely very, very possible. Yes, and the only horn that we've had reference to in a while is the one that Ghost led John to. That old war horn that was buried with the dragon glass. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, you know, I 
Can't say whether those things are related or not. But yes, breaker of ice. Certainly, we know there's a 700 foot wall of ice. It could it could also mean that he, you know, they were up in the frost fangs, and uh, John through ghost eyes saw them digging a whole bunch of holes. So maybe yeah, that was yeah. the breaking of ice. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, they needed water from the river. It was covered in ice, and he knocked it through. <laughs> could be all these things. Yeah. <laughs> John is pretty cool under pressure when he's talking to Mance. Mance asks if there were just five rangers. John says yes. I, I I will say he's cool under pressure, but I think he lies about the wrong things. I think he needed to be more upfront about some of these things. Okay. Yeah. Because because his lies are going to get found out and hurt him. For example. Yes. Is his plan to find the information he needs, and then hightail it out of there in the next, like, three days. Because if that's true, then he can get a message to uh, Geo Mormon in time for him to use that information to his advantage. But if this is going to be more of a long-term thing, then this army is going to, as you said earlier, it's going to discover the what the Great Ranging by itself. And denying the Great Ranging, which is basically what he did... Yes. Right, I see you what you're are saying. Creating a huge lie that you're going to get caught by very quickly, and I, I just think he's made a bad mistake here. So the five rangers, I would have said, no, 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 there are three groups of us. Why not? The other groups right. have turned round now, you know, or been yeah. captured and killed, you know. Yeah, sure. I definitely see what you're saying. If if this army comes across three hundred men sitting on the, the fist of the first men. You know, John's story about how just he and four other guys went ranging might seem a bit uh <laughs> It's it's false. like Pulp Fiction, the scene when the guy forgets to tell them about the guy hiding in the bathroom with the big gun. And he comes out <laughs> <laughs> So, John, why didn't you mention these 300 armed men hunting I thought you guys? had turned your cloak. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's um, a very good observation i like that yeah. um mance asked uh john how he knew where the wildlings were and Tormund jumps in with oh craster will have told them but you see mance was actually setting a trap to get john in another lie um and Tormund saved him from it because apparently john was planning to lie about everything oh we <laughs> read it in the weather you know <laughs> uh, yeah so Either the other two groups, we know there were three groups you had just mentioned. There are three groups that went ranging up into the frost fangs. Either the other two groups haven't been spotted, or Mance knows about them, and he's lying to John about not knowing, you know, or not revealing to John that he knows, and uh, but actually does know. So yeah, I think you mentioned earlier Thorin Smallwood was the group was the leader of the group that went up the milk water. And then Jarman Buckwell's group went up the giant stairs. Now, we know Thorne Smallwood's group came back to the Fist of the First Men because we heard it in Chet's prologue. Right. Jarman Buckwell, I don't believe we've heard anything from him or his men yet. So either they're still up there or something has befallen them. I mean, that one's not so bad because you've got plausible deniability. They only sent the five of us out. Maybe they sent more groups. I don't know. Maybe they sent groups out after us when we didn't come back in time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we left Castle Black several weeks ago now, the five of us. No, you didn't. <laughs> we see you over there on the Fist of the First Man. <laughs> Big fire. Or maybe Jarman Buckwell's group is coming back in different bits, and that's what those three horn blasts were. <laughs> hey, there's some over there. No, they were over there, too. <laughs> John. So like you were saying, Mance asks John, why were you ranging? What were you doing up in the frost fangs? He says, we were ranging. He said, I think it was Steer says, why were you ranging in the frost fangs? And John says, because all the villages were empty. The He says um, that the villages, everyone had vanished from the villages. And Mance's response is, I, and not just the free folk. And I wondered, what did he mean by that line that it wasn't just the free folk that have vanished? Yes, it's funny you say that because that line struck out to me as well and, and I, I have no explanation for it because everybody north of the wall is the free folk, surely. Right. Unless he means they're livestock. 
<laughs> yes, we'll see that. That's one of the things I was wondering. We noticed in the John chapters while they were traipsing through the forest that there weren't many animal noises. It's been quite quiet. They haven't seen a lot of animals. Now, that could be because 300 men are traipsing through the forest with horse and wagon and animals. Um, or could he possibly have meant what we were looking for in the frost fangs had vanished? He thought he knew where it was, and it wasn't there. And he's saying, yeah, it's not just the free folk that are vanished. What we've been looking for has also vanished. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He might also mean um, that the members of the Night's Watch keep disappearing. Because, of course... We know from Sir Waymar Royce and uh, Will and Garrett, well, at least one of Will, because of the TV show switching it around, I, I never remember which one it was who was killed north of the wall. I know. I, I believe Garrett is the one in the Garrett. books that yeah, survived. Okay. okay, so Will Will and Waymar went missing, and then uh, certainly Benjamin Stark is missing. So... And his mem- his whole group as well. And his whole they group, found right. the two that came back as white walkers, or as um, but no, uh, as whites, as, as whites. Yes, they, whites, they came back so. as whites. That's what I meant to say. Uh, but yeah, the rest, everyone else is all gone missing, and they don't even they do know that Garrod has been found because they found Ned Stark beheaded him. So yes, but other yeah. than that, they don't know where any of these people went. So yes, you're right. It very well could mean maybe he got wind of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, that that might be what you say. You would say, the, the yeah, the free folk are vanishing, and it's not just the free folk. Yeah, that does right. that actually hangs together. And I, I was good explanation, McKelly. <laughs> I'm revealing that I'm reading your notes here. So Mance reveals to John how he knows who he was because he's seen him. He's met him twice. The first time he was in Winterfell, when Mance was still a member of the Night's Watch, he was accompanying the then. Uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch on a trip to Winterfell and he bumped into John and Rob building a snow mound over a gate to dump on some un- unsuspecting person and Mance kind of like was friendly to them and said he would never tell anyone and he didn't this is a promise he was capable of keeping yeah, a yeah. piece of red silk couldn't stop him from keeping that See, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know it kind of reminded me of um, Elena Tyrell using the familiarity with Sansa's grandfathers, you know, and knowing Ned for telling the truth, as Mance establishing a previous connection with John to try and gain yeah. trust with. But this John. was a personal connection. I mean, John remembered right. it. You know, yes, not, they... not, John didn't deny it. But the second time was was more uh, substantial. I mean, he. This is as Mance Raider, king north of the Wall. He crossed the Wall infiltrated Robert Brathian's uh, party, came into Winterfell, played songs in Winterfell like Bale the Bard did, and was able to get intel on everyone to the point yes. where he recognized Jon Snow. Yeah, there's definitely some Bale the Bard. You could see that, you know, first thing that Jon blurts out when Mance tells, us, tells him the story is, Bill the Bard. Yeah. And uh, Mance admits that, yes, that was his inspiration. And there's definitely some similarities. He he infiltrated as a singer, snuck into Winterfell incognito. Now, as uh, Mance points out, he didn't steal either of John's sisters. So you know, right. there's, there's that part, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> but the fact that... So the reason John did not even consider Mance as king is because he kind of has an everyman appearance, which probably helped to go incognito if he looked like a big you know when you walk into a room everyone notices you kind of presence that might have hurt his ability to be not noticed (laughs) to blend into the background (laughs) if he looked like steer it might have stuck out a little bit more except for his ears would not have of of course it is so close to the story of pale the bard that it that it smells of like telling a tall tale it does, yes. You know, so uh, it it may be that he remembers him from a child, but I mean, it's a lot harder to remember a child as an adult than it is if you saw him six months ago. That yes, that is true. So this, the, it it does feel like it was probably true, and you wonder what was the point. I mean, he wanted to see King Robert. He probably wanted some intel on the Starks. You know, sort of like. 
maybe their willingness to send more troops to the wall to defend the wall. Right. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's a lot of hassle to go through. Yeah. Just, I mean, you got to scale up and then back down a 700 foot wall, right. not to mention all the territory you have to cover. Right. So you really got to have, you got to be motivated to want to see king to king, as he puts it. Yeah. So Mance being raised by the Night's Watch poses a question. I think we've discussed it, or at least discussed similar concepts before. Should he have been made to take an unbreakable vow if he was never given an opportunity to see the rest of the world? He was taken in as like a nine-year-old. Right. And he wasn't there because of any punishment. He could have left if he decided not to join, but it was really all he knew, I guess. Remind remind forgetful listeners of his backstory, if you would. <laughs> uh, so I he... don't know why you're laughing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, it's just the listener's benefit. Type. Exactly. That's what I'm. Trying, that's what I'm thinking of here. His parents were killed in uh, by rangers, if I remember correctly. And oh, he. But he was from north of the wall. That's the yes. Bit I was asking yes, about. he's oh, right. he's wildling, born and raised right. to a point, and then taken in by the uh, rangers of the shadow tower and raised in the shadow tower and then became a ranger which i mean often you grow up in what you know you 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 do what you know you know if you're if your family is in the circus you're probably going to grow up and be a member of the circus if your family is in sales you probably very well follow that path so he grew up at, at, in the night's watch and so he became a member of the night's watch but that you know he didn't have to he wasn't yeah. convicted of any crime you already know my feeling about uh making children make promises it's it's a what it shouldn't happen you should never make children make promises because sure it's they, they can't be expected to keep them and therefore you devalue the promise by in, by making a child make a promise so don't do it yep yep i agree i'm i'm, I'm with you i have a lot of sympathy for man's here you could argue that it's outdated to have lifelong terms for everyone in the Night's Watch. But then, on the other hand, it also allows men to commit more fully than if they only had a 10-year sentence that they had yeah. to pay yeah. off before they could go back to their lives. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's the there's the historical aspect as well. You want to keep that sort of like, it's a yeah. lifelong commitment thing going, but yeah... But Mance reveals that he didn't leave leave the Night's Watch for the crown. He doesn't even wear one. Or the wildling women. He points out that plenty of Night's Watch brothers have, you know, no no more women than him in the biblical sense. And uh, and it's not because he had uh, wildling blood. I mean, he says, you know, he, his blood is the blood of the first men, which the Starks share. So John has that too. Right. Um, and I think Egret mentioned that as well. Right. Yeah, she, she did, tied yeah. Bale. That's how she brought the Bale the Bard story up. But instead he tells the story of his cloak getting sewn with red silk and how that cloak was then taken from him. Uh, so basically his desertion came down to sort of like bucking against the conformity, which to me goes to the wildling blood, honestly, because sure. you know, yeah. that's, that's why you're bucking against the conformity. You just, it's not ingrained in you. Yeah, you know, my my thought when he told that story about how uh, Dennis Malister said his cloak, his newly red silk sewn in cloak was fit for nothing more than the fire now and he left the next day, I thought it would have made just as nice a tapestry. You know, right. He just mounted it on his wall <laughs> in his chamber and yeah. kept doing his job. But I guess it was it was the principle. He just... Just couldn't handle all this uniformity and having to conform to these rules. Yeah. So uh, John then reveals his lie, his story of leaving the Night's Watch, and how it's because he's Ned Stark's bastard, and how he was always treated as an outsider and less than the uh, true-born children of the Starks. Right. Which, you know, I mean, I think we've talked about it before. We we It doesn't feel that compelling. It feels like that's that's why he shouldn't have done what Ned wanted him to do. 
shouldn't have joined the Night's Watch. Fair enough. Become a become a minstrel yourself. Become the next Bale the Bard yourself. Don't, <laughs> right. don't join the Night's Watch and then desert. That just doesn't seem to make any sense. No, and of course, we, knowing John's backstory very well, know that him being the bastard of Winterfell is what drove him to the Night's Watch. Right, exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. then out of the Night's Watch. So, yeah. but, you know... So again, I feel Mans might Mans gravitates to this story as if it was, you know, just like vision from heaven. You know, this is absolutely what I thought you would say. To me, it feels not quite true that Mans is just like, let's bring this guy in, let's find out what he's up to. That's that's my sneaking feeling about this. That uh, very well could be. Now, so John thinks right before he starts telling Mans the story that this the the story he's thought up in his head. Is the only one is the only one Mance is gonna believe, and then he tells the story of him being a bastard and not treated uh, as well as his siblings, and possibly Mance accepts it because he because it's a story about being an outsider and a misfit, and since Mance was an orphan wildling raised in the Shadow Tower, maybe he feels some of those same kind of um, yeah yeah that's feelings. Very true. That's emotions. very true, and that's good thinking by John. If that's what he thought, of, what he thought through. Anyway, do you have some background for us? I do. This is back to one of those chapters. I wish I could borrow some from Sansa <laughs> One and just roll it over to this one. But I came up with a little bit. So, so Mance mentions that when he first went to Winterfell, the first time that he met John, it was as part of an escort for Lord Commander Corgyle. And as there's no reference to whether Corgyle is the Lord Commander's first name or his last name, we'll assume that it's his last name because there is, in fact, a house Corgyle in Dorne. The Corgyles are located in Sandstone, which, if you think of Dorne as kind of like a foot with Sunspear being out east in the toe, well, Sandstone would be in the western heel surrounded by dunes. They're, of course, bannermen to the Martells, and their sigil is three black scorpions on a red field. Now, here's a, a debatable noteworthy point here. We know that G.R. Mormont became the 997th commander of the Night's Watch when Lord Commander Corgyle died in 288. So, Mance has only been with the Free Folk, the Wildlings, for... At max, 10 to 11 years. But John remembers, that he thinks in his head when, when Mance is telling him the story of how he met him when John was, how he met John when John was a boy. John remembers Mance as a young black brother just a decade ago and now describes him as having long brown hair gone mostly gray. And to our knowledge, that's without Mance having any kids. Dalla's <laughs> pregnant with... <laughs> we've not heard of any others than just the fact that Dull is pregnant with his possibly first child so um, you know it just made me think of course you could go gray at any age but he thought of him as a young black brother like a decade ago and now he's got hair gone mostly gray and I was reminded of um, like those basically like heavy as the head that wears the crown like those pictures of the presidents of the United States like when they first take office yeah. and then on leaving just four to eight years later and how much they've <laughs> aged. <laughs> very yeah. good, very good. Well, as a comparison with the television show, this is broadly captured. The relationship between John and Egret is played up more in the show. Uh, so she does all the talking with John on the way in. Rattleshirt and the other characters are basically dropped from that. Okay. Mance is not playing the lute, but John mistakes Tormund for the king, to much amusement. Mance doesn't know John. There's no talk of him going to Winterfell. None of that. Okay. John's rationale for desertion is that he saw what Craster did with his baby boy lay it out in the snow for the White Walkers, and John witnessed the White Walker picking up the baby. Uh, Mance is clearly surprised to hear that John has actually seen a White Walker. This is like sort of startles Mance. Sure. John says that he then took that news, what he'd witnessed, to Lord Mormont. And Lord Mormont, or A, already knew, and B, did nothing. And that's why John's leaving the Night's Watch. He says, I want to fight for the living, and I'm willing to join an army that'll fight for the living. 
Oh, that's a good, that's a good story. Yes. I think, I think after they left Craster's, John and Lord Commander Mormont did have a conversation about what happens to the boy right. babies. But John did, unless I'm terribly misremembering, John did not see that. I do recall that scene from the TV, the TV show. show. And yeah. so it's, it's in my head there as well. Yeah. But um, I'm pretty sure John did not see that yeah. actually happen. So what do you think? I mean, by comparison. Oh, yeah. I, I think the story that he gives in the TV show is much more believable for a reason to turn cloak against yeah. the Night's Watch. Yeah. The other one, yes, like you said at the beginning of this episode, makes more sense why he would turn cloak on the Starks. Right. But has very little bearing on the Night's Watch. Pedantry. Do you have anything? I didn't find anything, really. I mean... No, I didn't. Yeah. At first I thought that maybe Craster's Keep was too far from the Shadow Tower to where they are in the Milkwater for them to have, for John and his group that he is saying, you know, they're five, to have made it to Craster's, found out about them being in the Frost Fangs and made it to where they are in the Milkwater. But I looked it up on a map. It's not too bad. I mean, yeah. it's it's within realm of possibility. The, the other thing is that that could have been a separate sort of ranging, went to Craster's, talked to Craster, brought the news back, news spread along the wall, and sure. sort of different groups were sent out. It's possible. Yeah. News and notes. So uh, the first bit of news is, uh, first I want to clarify news from last week. We mentioned that Martin canceled an appearance at San Diego Comic-Con due to rising COVID rates. That was true. He skipped public signing appearance. He didn't go on the convention floor, and he skipped all the parties that were going on uh, as well. But he did attend a House of the Dragon panel okay. at, comic, at the Comic-Con. His next leg of the trip... Oh, by the way, that was added. I swear that was added to his not a blog update after i read it because i'm pretty okay. sure i would i went back and looked and i was like wait there's an asterisk in here that says he is going to the right. panel anyway the next leg of the trip was to the house of the dragon premiere in la but unfortunately martin was a no-show for that because he's tested positive for covid he should have done what you said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just stayed away entirely exactly <laughs> Now, there's there's not, according to him, there's not need for too much fear because he's reported that he has nearly no symptoms, just some sniffles, and he's currently quarantined in a hotel room in L.A. He said, uh, he said if you got to quarantine somewhere, a four-star hotel room in L.A. is not a bad place to do it. So, um, There's an official HBO House of the Dragon Dracaris app. Allows you to, the AR of Dracaris is capitalized. Uh -huh. uh huh. Allows you to steal dragon eggs from Westeros, raise the dragons from hatchlings to Valyrian like monsters using AR through your phone, and train it using high Valyrian commands. That sounds pretty cool. That does sound pretty cool. Uh huh. And we've got a live video chat coming up with our Lord Paramounts and Royal Kings Guards, but that will have happened by the time this one airs. So it will, it I'm well. sure. We'll have uh, had a really great time. But uh, yes, by the time this goes live, that will have already happened. So. Yeah. Uh, All right, so conclusion. So John passed his first test. It seems that he's been accepted by Mance as a true turn cloak, or at least Mance is willing to keep him around to find out. Right. But like like we mentioned earlier, will he have such luck with the rank and file wildling? I actually think it might be easier there because they'll hear he killed Corin Halfhand and they'll be like, you know, they won't get the details. They'll just get the headline and that will be enough for them. Yeah, that's possible. Or, you know... They're raised to distrust and dislike Brothers of the Night's Watch, much as you know, Brothers of the Night's Watch are told to dislike and distrust Wildlings. So there's, it's possible that you know that he might have to prove himself to many of them as well. Yes, I, I'll I'll raise Mance Raider as the first uh, piece of evidence for the uh, accepting. <laughs> Yeah. Although Mance was born wildly, Mance so born he, wildly. he's it's got true. that. It's true. <laughs> but you have to wonder if, if being a Night's Watch and a Stark might elevate him in standing enough to get him close to Mance. That's 
Yeah. He either needs to get close to Mance or needs to get close to someone who can tell him what in the world they were doing out in the yeah. Frost Fangs and whether yeah. they were successful. Um, and then the question, the question about John's sort of like story arc is, is he going to continue to see all this through his Night's Watch eyes? Or is he, as uh, Ygritte predicts, going to start to like the taste of freedom? And Yeah, right. Start seeing yeah. this differently. Yeah, and um, I, I wouldn't have expected him to at this point, but he's got no outright information about whether Mance found what he was looking for in the Frost Fangs. It's not like he came in and Mance was like, you want to see something cool? <laughs> we got. <laughs> <laughs> but they have left the Frost Fangs, so either they left it in frustration with possibly a pinch of frostbite, or... They found it and are keeping it hush hush, which you would expect them to do with someone who says he's turned cloak on the group that they are trying to get past. Yes. This could be why uh, Mans threw Tormund out of the tent before he yes. grabbed. <laughs> does seem he does seem like the kind of guy who might just let it slip. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it seems like Egret has steered him straight from the very beginning from from when she very first met john she told him if you come with me mance will take you in and it, you know does seem like mance is willing to take him in so yeah she, maybe she helped him workshop some of his lies as well to see if <laughs> yes they had time on the on the travel <laughs> anything else i think we've covered it that's pretty good how about you okay. I feel good about it. There are three ways that you could help us. You could leave us a review. Um, they're always appreciated. You could buy merchandise at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com or you could buy us an arbor gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall. Join us at the Lord Paramount or Knight of the Realm level to, be a, to become a sustainer. And uh, we're grateful to those who already have. Absolutely. And of course, you can always reach us at ghosts.harrenhall at gmail.com. You can go out and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.